Okay. We've already met and talked about your interest in being a DMT volunteer. After a medical examination and a lengthy psychiatric interview, we decide you qualify to participate. You eat a light dinner the evening before and sleep fitfully. What will tomorrow be like? The next morning, you park your car at the University of New Mexico Hospital parking structure, walk across the bridge to the hospital itself, and take the elevator to the fifth floor, the Clinical Research Center. You walk up to the nurse's station and provide them with your DMT alias, one that you received in order to preserve, preserve your anonymity. After checking in, you walk down the shiny linoleum hallway to room 531, where the DMT nurse greets you and inquires about your welfare. She gives you the temperature monitor, which requires your going into the little bathroom and inserting a four inch wire through your anus into your rectum. Returning to the room, you take off your shoes and lie on the bed in your street clothes. The nurse places the black eye shades next to you on the bed. An IV is begun in one arm for drug administration and another in the other arm for blood drawing. The nurse places the blood pressure cuff on the arm next to her. I take a seat at the other side of the bed. Good morning, I say. Are you ready? Take as long as you need to collect yourself. Once you're ready, let me know. I will insert the needle into the IV of the arm near me and tell you when I will begin. The infusion of drug lasts for 30 seconds and then 15 seconds of sterile saline to flush the line. You may feel the drug going in, cold or tingly, slightly burning. Effects will begin within a few heartbeats. Take a deep breath into it as you feel the rush and let go. The rush is short, but it's important not to be thrown off balance. You'll quickly feel your consciousness separate from your body and think that you might have died. Don't worry, no one has. And if there are medical problems, a code team is always instantly available. There are two ways to deal with the fear of having died. One is to fight it with all of your strength, and I can tell you that won't work well. The other is to go along with it. Okay, I've died, now what? Try to maintain awareness at all times. Effects peak within two to five minutes, and you'll start coming down at around 10. There, there are still things you can notice between 15 and 20 minutes. I know there'll be a lot to talk about, but we can wait another 10 minutes, and I suggest trying to stay quiet until the half hour point. If after 40 minutes or so you're still quiet, I will begin engaging you. Any questions? You reply, I think I'm good. We place the black shades over your eyes. You're already going inward, breathing slowly and deeply. You indicate your readiness. Take a deep breath, settle into the mattress. I lay my watch on the bed next to your arm and wait until the second hand hits 15 seconds. Okay, I'm starting the infusion. The cold DMT solution makes its way up your arm. Your heart beats stronger and more rapidly. Your body feels light and excited. A high pitched sound begins ringing in your ears and waves of kaleidoscopic images form and rush through your mind. You feel the drug. You say, I feel it. Here's the flush, I say. Okay, it's done. But by then, you are somewhere else and do not hear me. All right, so thank you for that. That was definitely one of the more uh, creative meditations that I think we've had this semester. Um, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> So um, I, I can uh, go ahead and, and kind of introduce, uh, introduce you, Dr. Strassman, and then we can move into um, the Q&A, if that, that works for you. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> I 
uh, <clears throat> a native of Los Angeles, Rick Strassman obtained his undergraduate degree in biological sciences from Stanford University, his medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Yesh of Yeshiva University. He trained in general psychiatry at UC Davis in Sacramento and took a clinical psychopharmacology research fellowship at UC San Diego. Joining the, research, uh, joining the faculty at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine in 1984, his clinical research with melatonin discovered its first known function in humans. Between 1990 and 1995, he performed the first new US clinical research with psychedelic drugs in a generation. His studies involved DMT and to a lesser extent, psilocybin and received funding, uh, received federal and private funding. From 1995 until 2008, he practiced general psychiatry in community mental health and in the private sector. He has uh, authored or co-authored nearly 50 peer reviewed papers, has served as a guest editor and reviewer for numerous scientific journals and consulted to various government, nonprofit and for-profit entities. His book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, which I have right here, <laughs> um, has sold over 250,000 copies and has been translated into uh, 12 languages and is the basis of a successful independent documentary that he co-produced. He is currently a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. So welcome um, to our class, Dr. Strassman. Well, th thanks for having me. Pleasure being here. I love students. Great, great. Yeah, so um, we have quite a few students actually that signed up in advance to prepare questions for you. So I want to um, give them an opportunity to, uh, to ask their questions first before we kind of open the floor. So um, if anyone who has prepared questions wants to start us off, uh, feel free. Uh, I can go. So one of the strangest effects observed in the DMT experiences are the seemingly trans-dimensional entities, the aliens, giant insects, and the machine elves, which are claimed to be totally real by those who uh, meet and communicate with them. Towards the end of the spear molecule, you speculate on loose theories that multiple universes and dark matter could explain these experiences. How have these ideas aged, and what is the current path to researching psychedelics through that lens of metaphysical curiosity? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's it's a pertinent question too, uh, because um, I struggled to search, or I I struggled, you know, to locate um, uh, you know, scientific models uh, that could explain uh, the consistent uh, encounter with these you know, seemingly autonomous. Uh, you know, sentient beings under DMT in the DMT world. Um, yeah, and I do speculate about uh, parallel universes, dark matter, uh, you know, levels of objective reality that are normally invisible, uh, which we might then be able to perceive uh, with our mind brain receiving capacity changed. Uh, through the effects of DMT, uh, you know, kind of like a telescope or a microscope for consciousness. The things are already there or uh, the, uh, you know, things are always there, um, but you need to use a new technology or some external technology uh, to perceive them. And you could think of DMT as a technology. In fact, that's how one of our volunteers described it. Um, it allowed access to uh, you know, different freestanding objective alternative, you know, levels of reality. Um, you know, I still think it's a viable model, but we're a long way from being able to experimentally uh, refute or confirm the validity of that theory. Um, so uh, in the meantime, I've, 
uh, kind of you know, broadened the notion of previously invisible to include things which are existent in our minds already, uh, more or less conscious. Uh, and those things are, or are, or at least you know, can be invisible if you know they're unconscious, for example, or they're you know, pre-conscious. And the you know, medication, you know, the psychedelic, uh, will kind of amplify, you know, shed uh, some light, make clearer uh, things, um, which are completely. Uh, internal to you but which were also you know, previously invisible you know so um your mechanistic you know theories aside uh the your presence of the being seems to me to represent a symbolization or a visualization of certain kinds of information you know so if that information is external to us let's say in dark matter or it's internal to us from the unconscious. Uh, it's our you know, task to maximize communication, you know, when we can uh, between uh, you know between us and those things which were you previously invisible, which are you know containing information. You know, so how do we get the most out of what the images are trying to communicate to us? You know, whether they're internally or externally generated. Um, you know, metaphysics is a, you know, topic, you know, near and you know, dear to my heart. Uh, I wrote a book in 2014 about prophetic experience uh, in the Hebrew Bible and the possible, you know, relationship to DMT and other psychedelics. And the, you know, intellectual scaffolding of that uh, endeavor uh, were the works of the medieval Jewish philosophers like Maimonides, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, Sephardic you know, Jew who moved to Egypt uh, and was quite active there in the 1200s. You know, so, you know, the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians at around that time were developing these quite sophisticated models of existence, spiritual existence, uh, you know, physical existence, you know, psychological existence, which combined faith scripture, you know, text um, with the modern Aristotelian, uh, uh, you know, science of the day. And it, it, it was quite sophisticated. Um, and it was the state of the art. It was, you know, the cutting edge of intellectual endeavor. Um, and so I think uh, it's you know, possible using those, you know, notions to resume studying spiritual experience uh, with a combination, so to speak, of uh, intuitive spiritual information uh, you know, from tradition, from philosophy, uh, in combination with you know cutting edge uh, you know, science. Um, you know, so it would be a chance to you know start uh, you know reconciling uh, spirituality and empiricism, you know, science and religion, or you know, faith and reason. Uh, which is a you know, relatively recent development. Um, it only occurred in the 1500s, you know, during the Enlightenment. And, you know, then spiritual experience became, you know, completely internalized with Freud and Jung. Uh, so, um, you know, I think it's uh, the you know, possible you know, meeting point, you know, for uh, you know, science and uh, spirituality. Uh, to meet and discuss what should be around the spiritual experience, the mystical experience, the prophetic state, those kinds of things. You could, uh, you know, bring things in, you know, from the left and, you know, from the right or, you know, from above and from below. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Um, does anyone else who, who signed up um, want to ask their question now? There's one in the chat, Oliver. Is that from someone who signed up this week? Um, 
Okay, so, yeah, so uh, Rosanna says, um, sorry, I have to ask my question in the chat. Mike is not working well, but I guess I'm just curious to ask if there have been any studies assessing the effects of DMT to other psychedelics in regards to therapy. Um, also, given that there have been some issues seen when DMT, uh, when using DMT for therapeutic uses or for therapeutic, uh, th for therapeutic purposes, sorry, um, are researchers more inclined to use other psychedelics over DMT or is more research still being conducted? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good, uh, yeah, yeah, so those are some good questions. Um, well, you know, most of the new, you know, current research, you know, psychotherapy research uh, has been using psilocybin and, you know, to a lesser extent, LSD. You know, so, you know, these are studies in academic university, you know, research units. Um, you know, there's depression therapy, there's, you know, substance abuse, there's OCD, uh, there's smoking, cessation, alcoholism, end of life despair, uh, PTSD to some extent, all of those have been using psilocybin uh, among the classical psychedelics. Um, I think there was a you know, psilocybin autism study, I'm not sure, um, but you know, there's European studies uh, with you know, psilocybin as well. You know, the Europeans are using a little more LSD, uh, but you know, both of those are long acting drugs. You, you, you know, the reason that you know, people started using psilocybin is for you know, a couple of reasons. You know, one is it, is, it isn't as uh, you know, long acting as LSD. Um, you're kind of you know tacking an extra you know four hours onto an LSD experience, um, and it also uh, you know doesn't have the notoriety of LSD. Um, so you know those were a couple of uh, both you know clinical and political reasons you know to choose you know psilocybin over LSD, and you know one of the reasons I ch you know chose DMT over either LSD or you know psilocybin uh, was you know because of uh, the notoriety issue. Um, and the duration of action um, as well. Um, although in you know the case of DMT, it's over in an hour or like a half hour, really. Um, yeah, you know, so there are no pure DMT studies yet for depression, although one just began at Yale, like this week. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, there is one uh, you know, psychotherapy study with just, you know, pure DMT and uh, you know, just began. Um, you know, there are um, a lot of, uh, you, you know, reports, you know, therapeutic reports, anthropological, epidemiology, you know, demographic uh, studies of, uh, you know, people who are uh, in these ayahuasca using churches in Brazil in particular, you know, some in the U.S. Uh, and those are you know, field studies, as it were, you know, surveys, as opposed to actually, you know, giving ayahuasca in order to treat particular conditions. Those, uh, you know, the majority of ayahuasca studies uh, uh, indicating therapy are, you know, survey studies. Um, you give questionnaires and interview, you know, members of ayahuasca using churches. Um, you know, but there is uh, an, an, uh, a small, number and an increasing you know, number of more, you know, clinical, you know, research kinds of studies using ayahuasca for anxiety and for depression. Those studies are coming out of Brazil. Um, you know, there is increasing interest in, uh, you know, the therapeutic applications of DMT for both, you know, psychotherapy and other indications. Uh, that study at Yale using DMT for depression. Um, and, uh, you know, there are all of these you know, psychedelic startups kind of springing up uh, or, around the market landscape. And, uh, you know, they're, you know, looking at, um, you know, different, you know, formulations of DMT, you know, different, you know, routes of administration, you know, like, a, uh, you know, like a, you know, tablet or a film or a patch or, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, so, you know, those indications are probably mostly for depression, 
like you know uh you know because if you give your dmt as an injection it's pretty fast it's you know it's you know kind of hair raising um so um you would like a little slower onset of action well yes um so there's a you know question there about ayahuasca and you know, dmt yeah there are you know two ingredients of ayahuasca or there's you know two you know different you know plants you know one contains dmt and one slows the metabolism down of dmt in the gut you know so you know dmt becomes orally active you know because it isn't you know broken down in you know the gut as quickly on uh, there's harmaline as well you know which is an mao inhibitor you know which is also an antidepressant but you know, those kinds of, you know, treatments require a few weeks to start, you know, working, you know, so, you know, the visionary ingredient of the experience is, you know, the DMT and the kinds of, you know, neuro, uh, you know, neuronal changes uh, which occur uh, with, uh, you know, DMT are quick, like within the space of an hour or, or two, you know, so, you know, people are, you know, pointing you know, to the increase of neuroplasticity that occurs within a short time period, the space of an hour uh, of the response to DMT and also neurogenesis, uh, which begins very quickly after DMT administration. You know, so those two, you know, findings are being exploited or potentially exploited in, you know, two different directions. You know, one of them is as an antidepressant treatment uh, because, um, you know, ketamine is a new antidepressant, works quite quickly within sp the space of an hour or two, which corresponds to the, you know, time course of um, the acute neuronal effects. And, um, you know, so the acute neuronal effects of ketamine are, you know, similar to those of DMT. You know, so, you know, people are, you know, thinking, you know, that if DMT and ketamine you know, both produce the same you know, kinds of neuronal effects, you know, then perhaps, uh, you know, DMT will be an antidepressant in the same, you know, manner with the same time course. Um, you know, but our study, you know, back in uh, the 90s, you know, looked at, you know, sub-psychedelic doses of DMT as well. You know, ones that just gave you like a little stimulatory effect uh, or, a, you know, a little mood elevation or, you know, uh, you know, some calming effects, you know, so, um, you know, there is a, a company in Canada that's repurposing DMT to help reduce stroke you know, size uh, in you know, patients with stroke and also to speed, you know, functional recovery. And they're going to use DMT at sub-psychedelic doses, which, you know, seem to be adequate you know, for, you know, the neuronal response to occur. Uh, you know, so you're giving a sub, uh, you know, psychedelic dose, but one that is still neuronally active uh, for, uh, you know, recovery from stroke. You know, they're also uh, thinking about using this, you know, uh, you know sub-psychedelic doses of DMT uh, for traumatic brain injury. Uh, because of its ability to stimulate, you know, nerve growth and complexity uh, between neurons, and, you know, the complexity of connections between neurons. Um, so, you know, why isn't DMT used more often? Um, um, well, we may be, uh, you know, seeing uh, the you know, tide shifting, uh, you know, to shorter acting experiences like DMT or, you know, ones that could be used with a you know, sub-psychedelic dose. Um, but uh, I think up until now, anyway, um, there are some, you know, pharmacokinetic issues, you know, with DMT. If you give it as an injection, it's very fast acting. And if you're not an experienced, you know, psychonaut, it can be kind of disorienting. Um, th the other is that a full you know, dose of DMT is very weird. You encounter these beings that, you know, talk with you, they interact with you, they harm you, they hurt you, they help you, they hinder you, they confuse you, they're very strange looking, you know, they're doing things, you know, to you, and you're kind of in amazement and you're shocked. You know, so that isn't a typical, you know, psilocybin experience where they're playing, uh, you know, playlists to help with your depression. Uh, you know, DMT is completely different, it's completely out there. You know, so I think, you know, if you're, 
you know, thinking about, you know, using a full, you know, dose of DMT, uh, you know, uh, as an injection, uh, it can be uh, a bit, you know, too much. Um, but I think, you know, the idea of using, you know, sub psychedelic doses is, uh, you know, quite promising. So, you know, so you'll be hearing a lot, you know, more about uh, the potential, you know, therapeutic use um, of DMT in the upcoming year or two, you know, maybe sooner. I, I had a question uh, related to that. So like neurogenesis, could that ever cause a, a problem? Is neurogenesis in effect, is that always a benefit to the patient or could there be, you know, complications or issues from it? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a great question. And it, you know, kind of, you know, hinges on, you know, lots of my, you know, soapbox, you know, rantings for the last, you know, few years. Uh, you know, the straight, the, uh, the straightforward response is if it's, you know, traumatic brain injury and, you know, CVAs, you know, strokes, you know, you know, cerebrovax, uh, you know, cerebrovascular accidents. Um, you know, I think, you know, that the benefit, uh, would, you know, uh, you know, would of necessity, um, outweigh the risks. Uh, and, you know, so far, you know, there's animal studies, you know, which indicate, uh, smaller stroke size, if you're combining the stroke with, with DMT and, you know, functional recovery improves or occurs more, you know, quickly. Uh, in, you know, rodents, you know, that are, you know, the experimental model, uh, you know, so they start, you know, to walk more quickly or, you know, kind of, you know, uh, start, you know, uh, they begin to perform, you know, more normally, uh, you know, once they're, you know, treated with, you know, DMT to speed up their rehab. Uh, you know, so I, I think when it comes to, you know, neurological disease, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, benefits I'm out on that way, the risks. Uh, you know, with respect, you know, to using these compounds, including DMT, you know, for benefit, for, you know, psychological, you know, benefit to be like a you know, better person or to improve depression. I think when it comes to, you know, treating, you know, psychological, well, you know, it, uh, it you know, hinges uh, on the, you know, set and the setting. You know, so if you're treating depression by means of, you know, neurogenesis and your know, neuroplasticity, uh, you're steering the experiment into the direction of an antidepressant effect. You have a depressed person who's, you know, volunteering to participate in a study like this, and they want to get better, and they have, you know, faith in the uh, experimental procedure to improve their depression, to make them feel better. Uh, you know, they're educated about depression and psychedelics. You know, um, you know, when they're tripping, uh, they're encouraged to respond to the experiences in certain antidepressant kinds of ways. Uh, and afterwards, uh, the integration phase, uh, they're, you know, kind of... <clears throat> integrating their experiences in a, in a, you know, way, you know, to minimize their depressive, you know, symptoms, increase their self-esteem, self-acceptance, you know, courage in you know, daily life. Um, you, you know, so you're steering the experience, which means that, you, um, you, you know, the rest of your brain is, you know, working in a you know, beneficial direction. You know, so I think if you're growing more, uh, you know, nerve cells, if you're increasing the connectivity among them, I think what's, you know, going on or around those, you know, more active, you know, neurons will be quite important in determining what goes on with them. Uh, so, you know, it's like um, you're stretching up a, a, a you know, torn muscle. Uh, you know, if um, your healthy muscle is being strengthened and being contracted and, uh, you know, flexed in a you know, particular, you know, direction, then the healing, you know, muscle fibers um, um, will, you know, follow suit. Uh, you know, so I think the you know, same thing, you know, may be going on with, you know, you know, with neuronal recovery. You know, so you, you want to steer the experiences in the direction, you know, that you're, 
you know, seeking. Um, you know, so if you want a spiritual experience, you know, if you're a you know, relatively healthy person and you want a spiritual experience or you want to improve your creativity, you know, then you need to do your homework. You need to be, you know, doing those things, um, you know, currently. You, you want to be, you know, doing those, you know, things already. You know, so, you know, when you do trip, uh, you've, you know, created a, like, well, you know, like a, a, a well, well, it's what's called a creode. It's a, a you know, um, like a path, you know, that's beginning, uh, uh, you know, to be worn, you know, by, uh, uh, you know, traffic along a, a um, you know, specific byway. Uh, you, you know, so if you're already developing the creode um, with creativity, with spirituality, you know, then the uh, uh, you know, psychedelics will work on that uh, and come up with, you know, new ideas, new insights, new inspirations. Um, you know, um, if, um, on the other hand, uh, y y um, you're in a confused, chaotic state, or you're a you know, bad person and you want to become even worse, um, you know, the increased, you know, uh, you know, neurogenesis, the increased, you know, neuroplasticity, you, you know, those would be operating on what's already there in your mind, in your mind brain complex anyway. You know, so if you're already really confused, just, you know, chaotic, uh, things will just be, you know, more that way. If you want to be a more bad person, you'll understand you know, at a more deep you know, manner uh, the ramifications of being a bad person. You'll become more convinced or you'll develop uh, you know, new insights, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, so you're you know, basically you know, working with you know, the pre-existing material. Uh, you know, so you want to kind of optimize that in the desired direction. It isn't neutral. You know, it isn't like it's just brain food. You can grow, you know, weeds um, as well as flowers. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Chloe who uh, signed up in advance. She said, um, you mentioned that individuals should be cautious with therapeutic DMT use, especially those with a familial history of psychosis. Um, is there any way to prevent these psychotic reactions or are they kind of unpredictable? Um, also, are these reactions uh, generalizable to most psychedelics? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you can't, you know, guarantee that you'll prevent um, adverse effects from, you know, DMT or other psychedelics. Um, I think, you know, DMT, well, uh, you know, one of the reasons um, I chose, you know, DMT, well, you know, there were, uh, you know, like a number of reasons, you know, but another one uh, is that it's quite short acting. And I knew that my studies would be stressful from the environment point of view. Uh, they'd be taking place on a research unit, you know, busy university hospital. And I included in my grant application and my um, informed consent, you know, document, you know, if it's a bad trip, it's a short bad trip. Um, it won't you know, be for hours and hours and hours. You know, let's say, uh, you know, you were on LSD and it went, you know, sideways. I mean, you could be screwed for like, you know, like another, you know, six or eight hours. You know, with DMT, um, you know, it might be horrible, but it's only, you know, horrible for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes at the most. Um, you know, one of um, our volunteers developed, you know, panic attacks after um, an overdose um, of DMT. You know, we gave, you know, two people in the you know, very beginning of the study, you know, too much DMT and they just got confused and we, you know, lowered and, and as a result, you know, we lowered um, our high dose, you know, but as a result of that overdose, uh, you know, one of um, our volunteers um, uh, developed, you know, panic attacks, you know, um, um, you know, but they were transitory, you know, they resolved in a few weeks and, you know, he came back, you know, completed the study and, uh, you know, did fine. Um, a couple of um, our, um, um, a couple of our, you know, volunteers, um, you know, developed a recurrence of old depression. You know, they had been depressed, you know, years ago, 
um, and you know, briefly experienced recurrences of depression. Uh, one guy responded to getting back on an antidepressant. One guy responded to you know, psychotherapy. Uh, and we screened people. Uh, we, we screened people very carefully. You know, they all got a, a you know, research, you know, psychiatric interview that takes a couple of hours. Um, I spoke to them, you know, before they even took a step into the study, uh, you know, physical exams, you know, laboratory work. Uh, you, you know, we did screen out people with a uh, history of psychosis uh, or a, a you know, family history of psychosis. You know, that seemed, uh, you know, high risk. Uh, you, you know, depression, if it occurred, you know, years ago and they got a handle on what it was that got them depressed and it was, you know, uh, you know, years behind them. You, you know, we included, uh, you know, some, you know, volunteers like that. You know, but I think, um, you, you know, there were studies, you know, back in the, you know, 1950s, you know, 1960s, you know, giving, you know, psychedelics to schizophrenics, you know, giving, you know, psychedelics, you know, to chronic psychotics. Uh, and those studies were for a couple of reasons. You know, one was to compare the hallucinations, let's say, or the altered, you know, thinking that came from, you know, psychedelics with, you know, the altered mental experiences of you know, psychosis, you know, were they similar or, you know, were they different? Um, you, you know, because that was a you know, big area of interest when those, when these compounds first came out, uh, you know, they were being called psychotomimetics, you know, they, you know, produced a, a you know, time limited, you know, facsimile um, of psychosis. And uh, you could study, you know, psychosis, you know, temporarily, uh, or a, 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 um, acutely, you know, drug-induced, you know, psychosis. Um, you, you know, the other, you know, reason uh, that you know psychedelics, you know, were given to um, schizophrenics, other psychotics, you know, was to see if it could be helpful. Uh, you know, would they engage, you know, more? Would they pay more attention to their environment? You know, would their, you know, disordered, you know, thinking clear up? You know, would their hallucinations go away? Or would they develop, you know, new insights? Uh, would they engage in, uh, uh, you know, psychotherapy more? You know, so those were, you know, quite interesting studies. And, you know, they were kind of crude. Uh, you know, they aren't strong on informed consent, you know, details, you know, like that, you know, but it, you know, didn't seem as if all those patients went crazy and went, you know, downhill, you know, some improved, you know, some didn't respond, some got worse, but just temporarily and they returned to their baseline quickly. Uh, you know, same with, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, well, the positive responses as well. Uh, you know, so it, um, you know, was a, uh, interesting, you know, field of research, uh, you know, quite in, uh, and, you know, quite inconclusive. And I think it, you know, would be of use under extremely, you know, carefully, uh, you know, controlled settings, you know, uh, you know, to revisit, you know, the relationship between, uh, you know, psychosis, especially schizophrenia, um, and, you know, psychedelics. Um, someone from the YouTube live stream had a question. Um, they were wondering if you could speak about the extended state uh, DMT, the extended state DMT research that uh, Dr. Andrew Alamore has proposed a model for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a very cool model. Um, yeah, well, you know, toward the end of my DMT book, um, The Spirit Molecule, I you know, propose a, a continuous infusion of DMT uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you, you know, one would be to characterize the state more carefully. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if you're just smoking DMT or you're giving it as an injection, uh, it's over or you start, you know, coming down, you know, by the time you get your bearings, um, you know, establishing communication with the beings, uh, you know, getting oriented, uh, you know, towards that space, uh, which can you know, take a, um, a couple of minutes and you're kind of, you know, shocked at, you know, the transition, you know, those kinds of things, you, you know, so if you could extend that state uh, half hour or an hour, 
uh, you know, two hours, uh, you know, six hours, eight hours, um, you, um, you, you'd be able to characterize the state, uh, you know, much more carefully. Um, you can interact, you know, with the beings, uh, you can learn their language, uh, you could examine the, the flora and, you know, the fauna, you know, the geology of the place, you know, take your little, uh, you know, hammer and your hammer on stuff or your, uh, your other um, equipment and, you know, interact with the you know, contents of that state. Um, you could also uh, use it as a, uh, you know, therapeutic, uh, you know, tool. Um, you know, for example, if you have, you know, somebody that's, you know, working on an issue, you know, let's say, uh, you know, with their parents, um, you can put them in a, you know, medium state of intoxication and, you know, then, you know, they would tell you, uh, you know, that they want to come down and uh, you'd speak with them, you would do therapy and, you know, they would say, okay, I want to go up, you know, to that, you know, same level um, or, go, um, or go, you know, higher or, you know, deeper. Um, you know, so you, you could titrate the experience, um, you know, because once you, you know, turned off the drip, you'd come down in five, 10 minutes. Um, I got the idea of the continuous infusion study uh, because of the results of, you know, one of our experiments, you know, from the 90s, um, which, you know, demonstrated that closely spaced, you know, dosing of, you know, DMT, you know, didn't cause tolerance. You know, so you give a big dose every half hour, four times in the morning, and the last, you know, dose will, you know, cause the same, you know, psychological response uh, in strength as compared to, you know, to the first dose. And uh, even though our volunteers, you know, were all healthy, you know, everybody's got issues. And, you know, they were able to, you know, work through stuff over the course of the morning. You know, the issue would, you know, come up in, you know, dose one, you know, they would uh, get some more clarity in dose two. They, you know, you know, kind of, you know, bump up against a, you know, wall in dose three. And then, um, uh, you know, come to some resolution at dose, you know, four. You know, so um, I thought, well, gee, you know, if there's no tolerance, you could just, you know, give it, you know, continuously. You know, so uh, a couple of years ago, Andrew Gallimore, you know, contacted me and he said, uh, 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 you know, that's a great idea. You know, we should write a paper. Uh, you know, so he would, you know, take it, you know, from the point of view of the, uh, you know, pharmacology. You know, what would the loading dose be? What's the... Uh, the metabolism, you know, the half-life, you know, what would the steady, uh, you know, dose be? Um, and, you know, my contribution, uh, you know, to that paper, um, uh, um, you know, was the clinical, uh, you know, questions of, you know, characterizing the state um, more carefully and using it as a, you know, psychotherapeutic tool. Um, you know, so that uh, you, um, you know, paper came out five years ago, maybe, you know, four years ago. You, you know, so now there's three groups uh, which are interested in actually implementing a continuous infusion protocol. Uh, there's one group in Switzerland and, you know, two groups in England. Um, you know, I've been consulting with the British groups. So I haven't been consulting with the Swiss group, you know, but, but uh, you know, still um, it's about to become a reality, which you know, should be very, very interesting. That's very exciting. Thank you for that um, response. So um, Ariana has a question and it's, uh, it was mentioned in the lecture how the adverse effects of DMT, DMT should not be overlooked. And um, just to be mindful of the potential negative experiences, uh, since there is an endocrine component to the DMT experience, are those with common thyroid dysregulation, such as uh, hyper or hypothyroidism, included in the research studies or excluded? And does this make a difference in that regard? Um, well, there's a couple of issues there. You know, one is, uh, you know, thyroid health in the first place. You know, so all of our volunteers were screened uh, for, um, with a couple of, you know, blood tests, you know, for their thyroid function. And I think we found one person with abnormal thyroid function and excluded them. You know, so you do want to be as, you know, healthy as you can, 
you know, before you trip, that's for sure. And if you've got, you know, thyroid imbalance, you want to take care of that. Um, the other is, you know, um, are there effects of, you know, psychedelics on, uh, you know, thyroid function? Um, and, you know, I can't remember if there were studies looking at that in the you know, 60s. Um, I don't think there are any currently looking at that question. You know, we, uh, you know, so, you know, we looked at a slew of endocrine you know, parameters, in, um, including TSH, uh, which is the pituitary hormone responsible for, uh, you know, regulating you know, thyroid production um, of thyroid hormones. And uh, in response to, you know, uh, in response to DMT, there, uh, you know, wasn't any alteration in the levels um, of TSH. I think we mentioned that in our first, uh, you know, paper, um, the one from, you know, the archives um, of general uh, you know, psychiatry, um, or if, you know, we didn't, you know, mention that, that there was no effect on, you know, TSH, uh, there wasn't. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, so, and uh, the responses, you know, the hormone responses, uh, you know, that we looked at, you know, were acute, like over the space of an hour. Um, you know, most things return to, uh, you know, to baseline, uh, you know, within an hour. You know, growth hormone was, you know, continuing to climb over the space of the hour. You know, but I would think it, you know, would have started resolving an hour after that or so. Um, you know, melatonin didn't budge. You know, thyroid stimulating hormone didn't move. Um most studies nowadays, if they're, you know, looking at the endocrine responses to psychedelics, you know, they usually, you know, limit themselves to prolactin and cortisol. Uh, so, uh, you know, be that as it may. Uh, you know, what's, you know, more current, you know, nowadays is, uh, you know, brain imaging, you know, brain, uh, you know, functional imaging, you know, rather than the neuroendocrine responses. You know, my you know mentor um, at UNM was a you know, pediatric neuroendocrinologist, and so uh, you know he uh, you know, taught me two things. You know, one is you know dose response. You want to make certain it's what you're giving that's causing the response, and if there's a straight line correspondence between a small dose and a small response, medium dose and a medium response, a high dose and a high response, you're on pretty firm you know, ground uh, by, you know, proposing it's what you're giving them. It's, you know, the drug, um, you know, and also, uh, you know, back then, uh, uh, you know, receptorology, you know, what's, uh, you know, what receptors are involved, what, you know, subtypes of receptors are involved, you know, those were being quantified, you know, through endocrine, you know, variables. Uh, and, you know, so we looked at, you know, beta on endorphin, ACTH, cortisol, prolactin, you know, melatonin, growth hormone. We have some you know, vasopressin data, but we never published it. Um, yeah, you know, core temperature, you know, pupillary diameter. Uh, you, you, you know, we covered every possible base. Um, you know, so I guess you know that's you know some advice to you know future clinical researchers out there. You know, garner as much you know data as you can first time around when you're doing just you know phase one dose response study and you know normal volunteers. You know, characterize a number of different doses rather than you know needing uh, uh, you know to go back you know to the drawing board uh, once the drugs are being used you know therapeutically um, or uh, you know for other purposes. Um, you know, so adverse effects. Yeah, adverse effects um, are real things. You know, it's you know, it's you know, kind of a what's 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 the word? It uh, you know, kind of bothers me in a way. Uh, you know that uh, these are called you know challenging experiences. You know, rather than you know calling them adverse effects. You know, challenging experiences. You know, like if I slept you know poorly last night, that's a challenging experience, and. You know, so is you know permanent psychosis as a result of a bad LSD trip. You know, that's a challenging experience too. You know, so I, I think uh, you need to be a bit more you know realistic 
you know, not you know, sugarcoat adverse effects. You know, there are a you know range of adverse effects out there, from you know mild, medium, and and severe. You know, so I think you know challenging effects is a little bit, you know, gilding the lily, or you know minimizing harm. You need to call a spade a spade. You know, if you give a drug and something untoward takes place, um, I think that needs to be made you know public you need to talk about it you need to you know raise the discussion like okay i gave dmt and you know everybody's developed headaches and that's a problem uh yeah it you know should be published if that were the case uh, you know case in point is that um a number of years ago a study came out of you know johns hopkins you know giving psilocybin to the terminally ill and uh you know the responses were great uh, you know, mystical experience questionnaires were high. Those high scores indicating a mystical experience were, you know, correlated with improved mood, less depression, you know, less painkiller use, all kinds of, you know, positive things, you know, which were true and great, you know, but if you look at, um, at the body of the paper um, under adverse effects, um, it says there were no um, adverse effects, you know, to psilocybin in this study. And, you know, that's it, you know, but if you look in uh, the you know, supplemental material to that paper, which is only online, you know, the, you know, the very last you know, paragraph of the you know, supplemental material speaks about a suicide that occurred uh, in that study. Um, and it occurred with a low, low dose of psilocybin, a completely inactive dose, you know, pretty much, but, but still, within 11 days after that you know, person's experience, she killed herself. And, you know, why is that? Uh, and I think it's a result of the model that was being used. Like if the you know, goal of the model is to have a spiritual or a mystical experience, and if you don't, you have, uh, you missed the goal. And I think, although you don't, you know, really know, but I think, you know, this may have, you know, been what took place in that study is that you know she got a super low dose there was no way that uh, you know she was going to be having a mystical experience and figured you know what the heck you know that was a waste of time i'm you know no you know better off i'm even worse off and you know what's the point uh and and i think you know strictly speaking that was not a side effect of the psilocybin there's you know obviously not because it was you know it was a completely a completely inactive dose uh, but I think it was an adverse effect of the model. And I think that's a very important thing to discuss in, you know, the literature, in the media is, you know, it's a very complicated situation. You're giving a drug, you're preparing them, you've got this, you know, the, uh, you know, set in the setting, you know, so, you know, this, well, um, this, you know, was a, uh, you know, suicide in our psilocybin study. And, you know, what went wrong, you know, rather than saying it wasn't an effect of the psilocybin, uh, you know, so it's a lot more you know, complicated. Um, and it's important to, you know, shine a light on those kinds of problems because, you know, there are going to be increasing numbers of adverse effects to psychedelics as they're increasingly available, either, you know, medically, you know, semi, you know, medically or, you um, you know, recreationally, spiritually. And, uh, you know, some smart, you know, journalist is going to be, uh, uh, you know, digging around and, you know, discover, you know, that case uh, of, you know, suicide in a psilocybin study. And they'll say, you know, why wasn't this, you know, more well publicized? Why didn't you guys, you know, talk about it at all? Uh, you know, so I think if we're going to, you know, not repeat the mistakes of yesteryear, you know, uh, you know, looking at these, you know, substances uh, within, you know, the larger community, uh, we need to learn from those mistakes. Uh, you know, we need to be honest, straightforward, uh, transparent, disclosing, all those kinds of things. Is there anything... Um that you would like to leave us with at this point, seeing as we're pretty much at time? 
Um, well, yeah, what should I leave you guys with? Um, well, keep an open mind. Uh, I think it's human nature to prematurely close discussion of complicated things. Um, so uh, if, if there's anything we should learn from the psychedelic experience, it's, uh, you know, to keep an open mind, we might be wrong, uh, no matter how firmly <laughs> convinced we are that we understand what these drugs are, what they do, you know, how they work. Um, I think, uh, I think they're uh, quite interesting that way. Thank you so much. This has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you for coming out today and um, being part of our class. It was, it was really cool to learn from you. Well, thanks again for the invitation. My pleasure. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hey, Rick, we have two more questions from the live stream. If you wanted to stick around and answer them, um, totally no pressure either way. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so one of them, in, in response to what you were saying earlier, I mean, you talked about decoding the language and engaging in communication with entities inside the DMT space. Um, does this imply intelligence outside of subjective experience? Um, yeah, I just don't know. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you, 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 well, uh, it, you know, it, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, returns to the point um, I was making earlier on um, about, um, you know, the entities or, you know, the beings um, or even, you know, just the information contained in the state itself, uh, even if it isn't, you know, kind of discreetly, you know, condensed um, or localized into a, uh, you know, recognizable being. Um, you know, there is, uh, you know, there, um, well, there is um, information uh, that's contained in that state. Um, and, you know, whether it resides, you know, within us, uh, in our unconscious or pre-conscious, or if it, it exists, you know, someplace um, outside of us, like in dark matter or, you know, some, you know, Proxima, you know, star system. Um, the important thing at least, you know, practically is, you know, to get as much um, information as we can from the images which are presented to us, you know, so in a way it's like I'm interpreting, you know, dream imagery. Uh, you want, you know, to remember as much as you can. You want to have some, you know, tools, you know, that you apply, you know, um, you know, to the visionary state in order to enhance communication, to understand what's you know, being exchanged, and you know, then to think about it afterwards. Uh, and if you know, possible, are there you know references that you can you know, turn to to help uh, explain things that may not have been completely you know clear at the time. You know, so um, yeah, I, I think we're a long way off from determining the location of you know that information. But that, you know, doesn't, um, you know, relieve us of the responsibility of getting as much information as we can, you know, for, you know from whatever it is, um, you know, that is presented to us. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then one other one was, do you, do you have any thoughts or opinions on the stoned ape theory? <laughs> the stoned ape theory. Well, yeah, uh, you know, Terrence McKenna, you know, suggested, you know, that, you know, monkeys tripped and they would, you know, visualize, you know, sounds, you know, coming out of their mouths. Um, and it helped their vision and those kinds of things, you know, but the most, you know, uh, you know, far reaching is, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the discovery of being able to communicate, you know, verbally. Uh, you know, through, you know, visualization of language. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a cool theory. Uh, I knew Terrence, he, you know, sat for my first DMT experience, um, you know, quite an inspiration, uh, you know, super guy. Um, yeah, you know, but anthropologically, uh, I can't, you know, really, you know, comment on the strength of that, you know, theory.
Cool. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, see you later. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Okay, shall I leave? Yeah, you can stick yeah. around if you want to, but you're.